every step we've taken has been worth worth every blister, every every cramp for the people that we walk for. Residential school victims on the hearts of these walkers from Winnipeg. It's not about this university or that university, it's about starving people. Food insecurity hits close to home for the Kings and Dow community. And they're off! Santa Claus is coming to town for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. This is the Video Signal, live. Hi, and welcome to our final show of 2022. Later, we'll have stories about an exotic fruit farm in Lunenburg, and a hockey star aims high here in Halifax. But first, a group from Winnipeg has walked all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. It took them over three months. Yeah, that's quite a walk, Crystal, and you were there for the final steps. I sure was. It's an important one because it's to honor the lives lost at Canada's residential schools. But first, a warning, some viewers may find the subject matter in our top story disturbing. Up there? Right. Yeah. Right up there. These walkers have put many miles behind them since September 1st. Now, they have finally arrived at the Shubenacadie Residential School. They are met by a man who attended the school. He witnessed children being trafficked into sex. Yeah, it wasn't just the priest, it was businessmen that actually come in and say, you know, you could pick what child you want. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it was in there. It's like cattle. Yeah. My heart just breaks for every child I got molested. Despite the horrors, there are people who survived and they have come to see the walkers off. As they pound the pavement, they remember the lives lost and they honour those who survived Canada's residential schools. In 2021, over 215 children's bodies were found, buried on the grounds of Kamloops Residential School in BC. People were shocked, hurt and angry. Jasmine Lavallee wanted to do something, so she started a walk from Winnipeg to Kamloops. Then she planned to walk in all four directions. Every step we've taken has been worth worth every blister, every, every cramp for the people that we walk for. Waking up every day, packing and getting on that road. <laughs> every day is a challenge. The backpack she carries is full of children's moccasins, symbolizing the spirits of those who did not make it home and those who survived. Virgil Moore, also known as Wolf Who Walks Ahead, is a day school survivor. Joined it when Jazz decided to go for a walk. I will not allow her to walk by herself because it's just too dangerous for Native women to walk by themselves. Moore is from the Ochichak Kosipi First Nation in Manitoba. Trailing behind them is a driver who makes sure that no one runs them over. I call ahead to find places to stay or campgrounds and I'm like their caregiver, I guess you can say. It is day 97 of their walk. Lavallee has been fasting for the last two days. The pack she carries is heavy, but she is almost there. At last, they arrive to their final destination, Conrad's Beach. This is Lavallee's first time dipping her feet into the Atlantic Ocean. And I wanted to be here when they finish and um, to honor them for their commitment and their sacrifice and the strength that they needed to carry the spirits of these children and our, all the survivors across Canada. Now, the walkers will drive home to Winnipeg until next year when they hike to the Arctic Ocean. In 2024, their footsteps will take them south to the Gulf of Mexico. If you've been affected by the story and need to talk, you can call 1-866-925-4419. This Tuesday, dozens of people marked the anniversary of the Halifax explosion. The ceremony was held at the Memorial Tower in Fort Needham Park. A man whose family was killed in the explosion talked about the tragedy with reporter David Schumann. My granddad, uh, Eric Davidson, he was a well-known survivor.
Matthew Elliott has been going to memorial services for the Halifax explosion as long as he can remember. It's the first time he's spoken at the memorial about the tragedy that wiped out part of his family. Um, on my own side, the, uh, the Elliots lost 12 uh, people in the explosion, 10 of whom were never found. Um, James Elliott lost his mother, uh, his wife, his brother, his sister, and five kids. The annual service included a wreath laying to honor the dead. On December 6th, 1917, the Norwegian SS IMO collided in Halifax Harbor with the French SS Mont Blanc, which was loaded with explosives. The blast killed nearly 2,000 people and injured another 9,000. It leveled the North End and left about 25,000 people homeless. Uh, maybe the largest one prior to the, the atomic bombs. But it doesn't matter. It killed a huge number of Haligonians. Alan Ruffman is the editor of Ground Zero, one of the most comprehensive books on the explosion. He says we will never know every detail. Even the number of people that have died has not yet been totally sorted out, never will be. It really has shaped the entire city. Um, it was certainly um, devastating for the city, but the city rebuilt as a result of it. Um, and that rebuilding came from the resilience of the people, the survivors that were, uh, that were around. And I think that's an important story to tell because it's, it's why we are here today and it's why we're gathered. And For The Signal in Halifax, this is David Schumann. This year, record numbers of Canadians are reaching out for food assistance. Students in Halifax are no exception. Matthew Haber has the story. Students at Dalhousie are hungry. The rising cost of living is causing an uptick in food insecurity. The Dalhousie Student Union Food Bank is currently seeing some of their highest numbers of visitors. We've gone up about 40%. Um, we get a lot of people we don't normally would get. We get a lot of students from other universities. We get a lot of people that are employed. A new report from Food Banks Canada shows a 14% increase in food bank use since 2021 in Nova Scotia. Post-secondary student use has nearly doubled, jumping from 4% in 2021 to 7% this year. For many students, this is their first time turning to the food bank due to rising costs. My roommates and I have had to use it a couple of times this past semester. We buy a lot of our groceries communally to try and save money and it was no longer working. Students are not the only ones on campus affected by recent inflation. The DSU Food Bank says they're struggling to keep some food items in stock. A box of lettuce I used to get for around $51, just a case of lettuce. I went to get some this time, and it was $179. I'm like, yeah, no lettuce here this week. Prices are difficult to stomach now, and they are projected to get worse. Canada's Food Price Report predicts an average 6% increase in prices for Canadians in 2023. The DSU Food Bank wants help from the university as food insecurity rises. Wouldn't it be great if those actual executives that are sitting up there making six figures could sit in the same room and say, you know what, it's not about this university or that university, it's about starving people. It's about students that are living in tents because they paid tuition. Matthew Hebert, The Signal, Halifax. Coming up on the Video Signal. Basically a hometown uh, tournament. I mean, it'd be unbelievable doing it in front of my fans again. It's a shot, he scores! A local hockey star takes his talents to Team Canada. Why are they dressed up as Santa Claus? So I thought it'd be a fun event, and it's a good cause. A bunch of St. Nick's tie up their kicks for charity. That's later on the Video Signal. It may be December, but that has not stopped one Luderberg family from looking at the sunnier side of things. Annetta and Nicholas Clark are building an exotic fruit farm. They're hoping to finish in time to open this spring. Ella McDonald paid them a visit. Tucked away on a country road, five minutes from the center of Luneburg, stands a blossoming botanical paradise. An industrious mother-son duo is building the area's first exotic fruit nursery, on 33 acres of land. The Clarks moved to Nova Scotia from BC last year and are already finishing up their first major project, the greenhouse. We really fell in love with Nova Scotia. We were looking for two years already online. I came from Germany originally and we lived over nearly 20 years on the Sunshine Coast and uh, started the exotic fruit nursery. They are just not by accident, but I came across some interesting books about unusual fruit and I thought, oh wow, that would be so cool to have those. Clark began tracking down fruit suppliers. 
She started with persimmons and papaya trees. But it didn't stop there. These are um, peyoya or pineapple guavas. They are, the, the flowers are amazing, the fruit too, but the flowers, they taste like um, marshmallows. They're really sweet and puffy, the, the white leaves. Yeah, it was a lot of work, just the two of us. But then we, uh, yeah, kind of started building up the orchard, the nursery. I was homeschooled also my whole life. So, yeah, I learned a lot about business and growing about plants and biology, stuff from her. In 2021, the Clarks decided to make a big move, literally, traveling from the West Coast to the East Coast in a U-Haul loaded with precious cargo. Well, we have about 65 different varieties. And in the greenhouse, the main outstanding things that still have fruit on them too are the persimmons right now. And we had citrus. We have some really hardy citrus species, like the yuzus and the flying dragons, they're called. Clark has a busy season ahead. She plans on planting more nut trees, holding workshops, and selling cuttings and birdhouses. But first, she must finish the greenhouse. What I'm going to do with the greenhouse is we will have pots for sale, like plants for sale for sure. I always look on the ground, like when I find some trees and they're shedding seeds, so I pick them up and plant them. The Clarks plan to open in late March and realize their dream of bringing tropical tastes to this Canadian climate. Ella MacDonald, The Signal, Halifax. It's a holiday tradition for many young hockey players across Canada. The World Junior Hockey Championships. Many kids grow up watching the tournament and dreaming to one day wear the maple leaf on their chest. This month, the tournament is coming to Halifax, and a moose heads forward now has the chance to see his dream come true. Oh, a shot, he scores! Oh, what a beauty for Jordan Dubé! After entering his third season with the Halifax Mooseheads this fall, 18-year-old Jordan Dumé is no stranger to playing in front of a raucous crowd at Halifax's Scotiabank Centre. But this week, the Quebec-born forward will get a shot at playing in front of that same crowd and the rest of the world after he was invited to Team Canada's World Junior Camp. Everyone who plays hockey knows about the tournament and uh, yeah, I mean, represent, representing my country, I mean, it'd be great, but um, especially being here in Halifax, playing here, I mean, it'd be unbelievable. Dumé is currently recovering from a lower body injury but he was still one of 29 players invited to the weekend camp, where he will compete for a spot to represent Canada in this year's tournament. Team Canada did not invite him to their summer camp in June, but he has since caught their attention. He leads the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League with an impressive 54 points in 25 games. He's behind only the projected first overall pick in this year's NHL draft, Connor Bedard, for Canada's top scorer. Yeah, everyone I played with is really good, and uh, yeah, guys like Kata Ford played with him a bit last year, and Vidicek known him for a while now. I mean, uh, we all have a bunch of chemistry, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it helps obviously. Tick, tack, jump. Dume grew up outside Montreal, cheering on Team Canada, hoping to one day represent his country on the world stage. If he makes the team, Dume will look to help Canada win their second gold medal in just over four months. I knew it would be cool and I'd be happy to be a part of it and uh, yeah, now uh, I am, so sh hopefully I make it, but um, even if I don't, uh, it's great to be in a conversation with these type of guys. The Columbus Blue Jackets signed Dume on November 25th, leaving him with high hopes heading into this weekend's World Junior Camp. And with this year's tournament taking place in Halifax, playing in front of his home fans would be the cherry on top. I mean, it'd be unbelievable. I mean, like you said, just representing my country would be uh, great, but um, especially it's uh, basically a hometown uh, tournament. I mean, it'd be unbelievable doing it in front of my fans again. So, I mean, I'd be really honored to play. The first session of Canada's selection camp will begin on Friday at the Avenir Centre in Moncton before the team takes on the U Sports All-Stars in two warm-up games later on in the weekend. Canada will open their tournament on Boxing Day when they take on Czechia at the Scotiabank Centre in Halifax. For The Signal, I'm Brad Chandler. Christmas came early to Halifax this year. Over the weekend, dozens of Santas took over one of the busiest roads in the city. All dressed up as Santa Claus for a cause. Chase Fitzgerald was there. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas here on Quinpool Road. This weekend, more than 100 Santas gathered to spread holiday cheer. They arrived wearing red hats, white beards, and instead of boots, sneakers. Oh, because we thought it would be a great spectacle. These Santas are not only here to make spirits rise, they're also here to give back by running a 5k. It is the season. I thought to get this first race in, it'd be fun to dress up, right Hayden? Yep. 
so I thought it'd be a fun event and it's a good cause. The annual Ho Ho Holiday 5K started in Collingwood, Ontario. Since 2017, cities across Canada have participated by hosting Santa races and raising money for Make-A-Wish. This year, Quinpool Road is hosting the Ho Ho Holiday 5K for the first time. 114 Santas participated on Saturday. Although the reindeers didn't make it, a few Santa paws did. While some Santas trained for months, others got ready last minute. We ate like Santa Claus last night. I had cookies. Drank some fingers. milk. Yeah. So we have fully embodied Santa Claus for this race. Alexander Gonzalez moved here from Panama three months ago. He's run marathons, but the 5K still proved to be a challenge. The weather was uh, difficult for me because it's too cold. Gonzalez was the first Santa to finish the race. An 11-year-old took second place. He says his secret to success was simple. It's like you just go fast and then you go faster. And then when you see something, someone, you pass them and then you come in second. The event raised about $1,500 for Make-A-Wish. Short of the $10,000 target, but organizers say there's always time to donate. As for the Santas, they had a holly jolly time. I met three new people today, so it was great. So great that even the Grinch got into the holiday sphere. Rudolph, you better watch out. With these shoes, Santa might just outrun you this Christmas. All right, let's get it done! Chase Fitzgerald, The Signal, Halifax. Thanks for watching this special live edition of the Video Signal at the University of King's College School of Journalism, Writing and Publishing. I'm Brad Chandler. And I'm Crystal Green. For more news stories, follow The Signal on YouTube and Twitter, or go to The Signal, go to signalhfx.ca. Happy Holidays! Yay! 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 Yay!